So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Will Rathaus. Uh, I'm a community engagement archaeologist working with MOLA on the Thames Discovery Programme. But before that, I was a support officer with Mind Aberystwyth, where I designed and led a survey of war memorials by mental health service users. So in this paper, I'm going to briefly cover the reasons I believe archaeology is particularly well suited to support mental health and well-being, giving some of those causal factors. And uh, I should describe the, les the lessons drawn from projects I've volunteered with, read about and organised for a proposed expansion of the work of Thames Discovery Programme's outreach work. So just very quickly, and this is rehashing stuff I've been yakking on about for years, is that um, occupational therapists, my brother's one, are taught that a good therapeutic activity must be a meaningful occupation, which I take to mean not just keeping someone busy for the sake of keeping them busy, but giving them an opportunity to produce something useful, something wanted, in the case of archaeology, knowledge of the past. The degree of concentration and focus that doing archaeological fieldwork can generate echoes distraction techniques, mindfulness meditations, etc., shifting the mind away from intrusive thoughts of worthlessness and of being watched. Knowledge about the past and the people who occupied our spaces before us can provide a sense of rootedness, a sense of belonging that is often lacking. In my work as a support officer, I found lack of confidence and low self-esteem to be serious problems for an awful lot of the people I worked with who were experiencing poor mental health. These both created and were exacerbated by the negative interactions they had with an isolation from other people. So being with a group working on an archaeological project, as has been suggested with Operation Nightingale, could be a vast uh, help for them. Exposure to sunshine and fresh air have been known to benefit mental health for a long time, as indeed has physical exercise. And a study by Bristol University identified a bacterium, Mycobacterium vacai, if I remember correctly, living in the soil, which they have stated secretes a chemical which helps fight depression. So archaeology to support rehabilitation and well-being was not use prior to 2012, but its use in mental health began to grab the headlines when in 2012, Operation Nightingale and a project called The Past in Mind began to uh, hit the news. So I had the very good opportunity to be able to do some volunteering with uh, Operation Nightingale. Um, I previously served as a territorial soldier. I'd been working with MIND and just after I completed my PhD, I went off to join in with Exercise Marne Explore, which you've heard about already. And I then went on to do Exercise Artemis 16 at RAF Acretary in Cyprus. Now these were both quite intensive digs where the vast majority of participants were working and being accommodated well away from their normal home for the duration of the project. But peer support from other participants and specialist support staff, including trained mental health nurses, were on hand. One of the originators of Operating Nightingale was very keen to get me to get my head around the importance of not encouraging participants to keep on volunteering, to not build dependence. Mon Barracks was particularly notable for its inclusivity. Veterans living nearby who were perhaps unable to work on it full time were able to participate the extent that they felt able to by being bussed in and back again. So what did we get up to with MIND? Well, inspired by Nightingale and the past in mind, we started to take service users on digs from 2014. But in 2017, we launched our self-contained mental health archaeology project that we'd put together ourselves. Using ideas formulated by Jenny McMillan and Ian Bapti for the past in mind project, I was very keen to involve participants in the planning as far as possible. The early planning in order to get the funding had to be done separately, 
But once we'd actually got that in place, we wanted them to be involved in actually planning how we're going to do the field work. But they weren't really very interested in doing so. However, by the end of the project, more than 40 memorials have been surveyed and a written report lodged with archives, including the National Library of Wales, the Royal Commission on Ancient Historic Monuments in Wales and Dubbard Archaeology Trust. But we did have a relatively low take up, about half a dozen people being involved. The project would have benefited definitely from higher uptake levels. I was very keen to build up statistical, numerical data to support the efficacy of uh, the concept, but unfortunately we didn't have a statistically significant number of people, especially not those who were willing to actually record how they were feeling from day to day and at the beginning and the end of each fieldwork session. So the Thames Discovery Programme. I've been with TDP now for um, six months, but it was launched in 2008 by Gustav Milne and Natalie Cohen. And its purpose is to record archaeological features as they appear out of the tidal foreshore of the River Thames within Greater London. Today, the programme is managed by Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA, and supported by City Bridge Trust, part of the Corporation of London, and by the Tideway Project, which is building a super sewer for flood protect prevention under the river. It comprises four professional archaeologists on staff, of whom I'm the, most, uh, the newest recruit, and over 150 active volunteers, whom we refer to as PROGS, after the initials Foreshore Recording and Observation Group, which they comprise. Now, as my colleague Helen Johnston's previously reported, Frog members have described volunteering as supportive of their well-being. One said, I have benefited personally in many ways. My energy levels have been higher and the Frog TDP initiative has motivated and inspired me. And this relates in turn to an increase in self-esteem and confidence and general health. Another Frog was keen to emphasise the social benefits of working with others who share a common interest. So we've got one of the largest sites in Britain, the whole Thames foreshore across Greater London. And the reason why we're particularly keen to, we feel it's necessary to do this work, is it is an endless task. Constantly new features are being eroded out and existing features, like this um, pier for a Tudor palace, um, over five years, some of the timbers have started to be washed away, and you can see these have emerged over a foot further out of the bank. Eventually, they will be gone. They need to be recorded before they disappear. This is why TDP needs to be an open-ended archaeological survey. Now, my particular role within TDP is funded by City Bridge Trust, and uh, my role is very much to reach out to older Londoners, people aged 75 and over particularly. And we do this through talks and lectures, sometimes with handling collections. We take them on guided walks on the foreshore and we're doing an oral history and reminiscence uh, programme as well. The funding for the programme is up for renewal this, sum this summer and we're keen to incorporate lessons from earlier projects to help participants, volunteers and target audiences to get more out of what we do. So in the future, Thames Discovery Programme hopes over the next couple of years to extend our work beyond the young and the old and to focus work on mental health service users, armed forces veterans, dementia and Parkinson's groups, and London's, Londoners aged over 65 who are at risk of isolation. We hope to be able to offer talks and lectures and guided walks, as we already have done, to include members of these groups within the foreshore archaeology training as provided to frog members, and to help them to undertake frog, foreshore field work, and also to provide art and photography projects. For some participants, these outreach events will be a doorway <coughs> into longer-term engagement with the archaeology as frog members. 
So what lessons can we learn? Volunteering on Operation Nightingale projects, such as Mark Explorer and Artemis 16, and discussing wellbeing archaeology projects with staff members and uh, with other, other people within this uh, area of interest, has brought an awareness of dangers of encouraging dependence. Operation Nightingale has also been extremely successful in encouraging learning after completion of the digs, with members going on to study formally and take up work within the sector. Op Nightingale's been very good at asking people how best to provide the support that they need. Mind Aberystwyth's War Memorial, Service has dem War Memorial Survey has demonstrated that a high degree of advertising and network is, is often necessary to attract participants in statistically significant numbers. For the same reasons, we're very keen to build strong connections with partner institutions and organisations. Both projects have included trained support specialists <coughs> to deal with any crises and to support participants to engage fully in the archaeological activities. Bearing these lessons in mind, we are applying for two years of continuation funding from the City Bridges Trust. And we're very keen to build further partnerships with local mind organisations, mental health organisations like SANE, Breaking Ground Heritage, Royal British Legion, SAFA, and particularly with the NHS. I'm very keen to get occupational therapists involved and to build connections with social describing professionals. We are keen that the partner organisations which should provide the support workers who are better placed than any archaeologists to support their clients. And will hopefully know the individuals personally and be best placed to support them that way. And we're keen to see the discourse develop, in which case, watch this space. I just want to talk very briefly now about the fieldwork models we use. Breaking Ground Heritage, uh, Operation Nightingale, seem to provide, on the whole, a shorter and more intensive model than we operate with the Thames Discovery Programme. It provides a clear endpoint for the uh, particular project, although there is the option to uh, engage in further digs. They tend to be working away from home, and this may be challenging for some, but it also may mean that people can come in from isolated areas to participate. For example, it's going to be quite hard for people to uh, get involved in Thames Discovery pro uh, <coughs> Programme if they're coming all the way from somewhere like Leeds, because we don't have accommodation for them, and it tends to be little short bursts over an extended period of time. On the other hand, the little often approach used by both War Memorial Survey and Thames Discovery Programme can be open-ended funding permitting. And this facilitates an ongoing engagement with archaeology, which can be as a hobbyist or potentially as a professional. Either way, this can provide a sense of purpose or ambition, self-esteem, self-confidence, exercise, connection, and thus benefit mental health and well-being. Care may still need to be taken to avoid dependency, time management, signposting to other services, treating everyone as individuals, and promoting other opportunities and means which we within TDP have identified as uh, safeguards against building that kind of dependence. But also, it's got me wondering if these two models maybe can operate in a complementary manner. Perhaps a little bit of gentle immersion via something like TDP can help potential participants in more intensive, immersive projects to decide if this is really suitable for them. Um, perhaps the in-depth projects can provide people who've already done little and often volunteering to build up their skills and vice versa. So basically I want to thank you all very much for listening to me waffle on. Please feel free to get in touch uh, via the email address there, telephone number, and our website. And feel free to follow us on social media. 
I hope to bring you more news of how TDP and wellbeing archaeology develop in the future. Thanks again.